Oh, that's nice. Oh, she's helping. That's, that's great. All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kabbalah and Coffee. It's great to see everybody here this fine Sunday morning. And now I know the date, November 10th. All right, it's great to see everyone. Okay, so we have a lot to talk about. And really tonight, uh, sorry, today, it's all about chaos. I titled the email, um, I hope everyone's getting the email, I titled the email Chaos Theory. It's all about chaos. So let me explain. Kabbalah explains that before our realm of existence, i.e. before the universe as we know it, there existed another plane of, there existed another reality known as the world of Tohu. In English, it's usually spelled T-O-H-U. In Hebrew, it's Tav Hei Vav, Tohu. Not to be confused with tofu. That's something, yeah. that's something completely different. <laughs> what is tohu? In fact, the word tohu is in the Torah. V'ha'aretz, it's like the second or third verse of Genesis. It says, V'ha'aretz haita tohu vavohu. The world was chaotic and empty. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. It refers to the beginning, the beginnings of creation as this emptiness and void. Tohu vavohu. So Kabbalah teaches that not that our world was tohu, but that there was another plane of existence called tohu that existed before ours. And what is tohu? Tohu is known, and it's, I think it's a really accurate English way to describe it, the world of chaos. So what is chaos? Chaos is many things, but in, in, the, in the description of Kabbalah, chaos is a state where the light is too big for the vessel. That's a definition. The light is too big for the vessel, and that constitutes chaos. So let me explain. Everything operates by an interplay of light and vessel. So for example, when it comes to education, pedagogy, teaching, so information that you're learning would be the light, and your mind would be the vessel that's containing that light. Right? Just like a vessel. Here I have tea. Today I opted for the first time in a while for hot tea. Why? I don't know. It felt like, like the right thing to do. So, so, um, so this is the vessel, right? This cup is the vessel, and it's containing, it's containing the liquid, it's containing the tea inside. Likewise, again, in a non, let's say, um, materialistic way, non-material way, our minds contain wisdom and information. So last night we had this fellow, Professor David Tom Imbo. And he's a, he's a smart guy. He's, he's very smart. And if he would, and he's coming tonight and he's speaking about, I'll just read his title, Entangled Identities, the Nature of Existence in Phys Physics and Kabbalah. Yeah, and there's a lot more explanation that's not even on this, uh, on, this, on this flyer about the talk. If he would just start off on his level of understanding, not start with background information and building it up and taking us through the building. No, if he would just jump right into the topic, he would, at least me, he would lose right away. I wouldn't get what he was saying. right? Because I don't have the background, I'm not a physicist. I mean, I studied, I have some background in science and physics, but I'm not a theoretical physicist by any stretch of the imagination. So if he would just start off on his level, right? He has, a, he has an institute, he's the he's a, he's a director of the Institute of Quantum Study at the Extreme, something like that. So if he would start off like on that level, the light would be too big for the vessel, right? Too much... Not only, not only too much information, the information would be too abstract, too lofty, too high, too whatever for, at least just being from personal, from, from my personal, uh, you know, where I'm coming from, would be too big for the vessel to contain. And so we have this notion, we have this phenomenon in many different areas where the light could be too big for the vessel. For example, a child, God forbid, here's a negative example. A child might, God forbid, experience trauma. And the trauma might be too big for the child to be able to process. And again, God forbid, right? Obviously. And that's another case where the light 
in this case, negative light. Right? Not, not all light is, is positive and life-giving. Here we have a negative light that is too big for the vessel to contain. And oftentimes that creates, it, 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 it creates a damage in the vessel. The nature of too much light in a vessel usually, I would say, almost necessarily damages the vessel if it's really a lot of light. Another physical example is the, the, the eye, the physical eye, and the sun. The sun is too much light, right? We, we, we know this, right? You can't stare at the sun. Why not? It's going to hurt the eyes. It's going to damage the eye. Why? Because the light is too big for the vessel. Expose the, the human eye. Now, the human eye is designed to take in light, but only in a certain measure. You take in too much light, not only is more not better, right, if this amount of light is good, so this amount of light is even better. Not always is more better. Not only is more not better, it could, God forbid, damage the vessel. Like the example that I, uh, that I often say, if you've heard me say this before, if you take a paper cup like this and you fill it up with water or with you know, something hot, it will contain it up to a certain point. But if you take a, um, if you take a fire hose, right? Is that what it's called? The fire hose. What else would it be called? Right? And, and you hold and you want to fill up, fill up your... Do they use water or do they use a chemical? What are they using? Water. They use water. High pressure. Perfect. High pressure water, right? So you say, I want a cup of water from the fire hose. And you hold your paper cup. What's going to happen? Not only are you not getting more water, you're not going to get any water because you won't have a cup left. It's going to obliterate the cup. So the nature of light and vessel is always that in order for it to be sustainable, the light has to be tempered, limited, measured, based on the capacity of the vessel. Now this is like fundamental, like ABCs of teaching. You walk into a classroom, you have to know your students. What do they know? What are they capable of knowing? Right? How do they learn best? You have to know this. And then you take whatever's in your head, before obviously, and you take that, that information, or the wisdom, whatever it is that you have inside your own head as the teacher, and you almost put it aside. And you reconstruct it based on the vessels of the student or students. This is known as a process, and, and many of you are, are familiar with this, with this phrase, this is known as the process of tzimtzum. What is tzimtzum? Tzimtzum is contraction. We're taking something that's very big, too big, to fit into a vessel, and you're being mitzamtzim, you're contracting it, making it smaller, more condensed, so that it will fit into the vessel. So again, I'm giving you a lot of parallel examples. Here's another one. It says in Kabbalah that before, before anything else existed, it was just Hashem, just God. And the way it's described in Emek HaMelech, which is one of the great Kabbalistic works, so it says that there was light, the Arein Sof. Remember with that term, Arein Sof? Arein Sof means the infinite light, because it's without end. right? It said the infinite light was filling all the space of creation. In other words, the space that would... The, there was no creation then. It was just God and, and infinite light. But the space that would eventually become the space of creation, there was no space because God's infinite light was infinitely filling all that space. And the nature of infinite light is that's all there is. So what does God do? God is... So it says that, that Hashem, that God, contracted the infinite light Remove the infinite light, created a makam chalal, a makam pano, an empty space, and in that empty space, then re, I don't know what the right word is, re, um, reintroduced, re emanated, whatever, an array of light known as the kav, a, not the infinite light, a kav, a limited ray of light into that space to now provide the groundwork. You need a stage. But once you have an empty stage, you then need to put in energy for the creation. And that and the energy of creation is the kav 
that is reintroduced after the, the removal of the infinite light to then energize the space of creation. Okay? So that's what's going on according to Kabbalah. But what do we see here? What we see is when you have something that's too big, not only can the recipients not receive, sometimes there's no place for a macabre for a recipient. Right? With infinite light, there's simply no other room. There's simply no other space. And so God removes the light in order to have space. By the way, if, you've, uh, if you took the last series that we did, which I call Decoding the Universe, so you know this was a major point that we said in that, in that session, in, in, that, in that series, that when Kabbalah speaks of God removing the infinite light and the symptom, the contraction, removing whatever it is, it's not meant literally. It's only for us. God is still there from his perspective. From our perspective, there was a removal or an absence of, of the light. Now, how can both be true? Again, we, we discussed it at length. This was actually a point of major um, controversy amongst the Kabbalists. Some learned tzimtzum kipshuto, literal, literal tzimtzum, that God literally removed himself. God's not a gender, but removed the light and created an actual space. And others, including the Chabad tradition, learned that it's not, not a literal tzimtzum. God is still there. But God is able to conceal the light in such a way that it looks like the light is absent, which then gives rise to the, the possibility of existence. Again, it's a very intricate and complicated debate amongst the Kabbalists, and we'll have to leave that for another time. But the point is, the central core idea here is that almost everything in life is an interplay between light and vessel. Every conversation that you have, any communication, is information coming from one person to the other, and the other person is listening, hopefully, right? So you have light and vessel. And again, the ideal is the ideal is that the light be tailored to fit the vessel. Because if it's not, then it could damage or obliterate the vessel. Okay, so I thought that God, that, that in the creation of the light in the vessel, the vessel shattered, which is why we got here. We're about to get there. Okay, so yeah. I'm having a hard time because that means We're God put in more than two. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. This is, this is what we're about to get to. So now, now the, so this is the normative approach. In other words, a sustainable approach, not normative, uh, a sustainable approach to light and vessel is that the light be tailor, tailor made, tailor designed to fit the capacity of the vessel. Right? What happens in the world of Tohu, the world of chaos? There was too much light. The, the lights were too big and the vessels were too small. That's what it says. The oros were merubim, too much light. It means qualitatively. And the kalim, the vessels, were mu'atim, were small. In other words, they weren't able to receive that capacity of light. And so what happened? The shattering of the vessels. This is known as shavirat ha-kalim. This is very important. This is like core, fundamental Kabbalah explaining the nature of things. It, it explains so many things. In this realm before ours, there was too much light and too little vessel. In other words, the vessels were too small, too weak, whatever it is to contain the light. And so what happens is the light shatters the vessel. Like if I held this paper cup in front of the fire hose and it would obliterate and shat. If I held a, um, like a crystal glass, well, carefully with gloves, right in front of that, and then it shatters, right? That's akin, it's similar, again, obviously not physically, but that's similar to what happens in this world of chaos. The light is too big, the vessel's too small, and the vessels obliterate and shatter. Shvira Takelim. So then God creates a sustainable realm that's known as, you'll love this, because you know this word, 
It's known as the world of tikkun. You ever hear the word repair? So there's a world of chaos where things break, and our realm is tikkun. That's because I read your email. See that? I love that. I love that. Yeah? Good. So the world of tohu is chaos. I want you to learn these terms, right? Tohu is chaos. And tikkun is order, repair. Tikkun means it's fixed. What's fixed? In our world, trust me on this, the light is not too big for the vessel. We're very fine. None of us walk outside or wake up in the morning. I can't say none of us, but most of us are not overwhelmed by the presence of God to the point that we can't exist in that presence of the divine. We wake up and we're like, yeah, I exist. The vessels are really big. The physical vessels are very big and the divine light, very small. It's the opposite of the world of chaos. In the world of chaos, the light was, was of a great magnitude. The vessels were too small. In this world, it's the opposite. The vessels are very broad, a lot of vessels, and the light, the light trickles in. We may get a little bit of light. The more we're aware, is it somebody there? Thank you. Okay. So in our world, we don't have this problem of too much light for the vessel. We have plenty of vessels. But we have so much chaos. Yeah, we do have chaos. We're going to talk about how that chaos is a source of our chaos in a moment. That's where we're going to get to. But our world fundamentally is built on a different platform. So the platform of the world of chaos is a lot of light. Hey, good morning. Great to see you. Kabbalah and coffee. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, right. this is it. How do you miss this, right? Okay. So, it's a different platform. It's a totally different structure. It's a totally different... Um, uh, um, just everything is different. So, the world of chaos, a lot of light, little vessel. This world, little light, a lot of vessel. Now, so what does this mean? So, the Kabbalah says... And this is mainly, you should know all of this, lights and vessel, uh, the, the light, the vessel, tohu, tikkun, chaos, repair, shattering of the vessels, all of this is found extensively in the teachings of the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, the great um, Kabbalist of the 1500s. Now, so this is like the, the bread and butter of Luriana Kabbalah. The Arizal continues to say that those, what happened to the shattered shards, what happened to the pieces? Us. They're embedded in, they form the fabric of our Tikkun universe. I'm going to explain the concept, but first let me lay it out on a, on a structural level, if you will. So the, the remnants, the shards of the vessels that were shattered are embedded, if you, if you can picture, like I like the glass idea. Imagine glass shattering and like spikes of glass like being embedded and that's embedded into the fabric of our universe everywhere we look there are sparks shards of the vessels which have light why did, why do they have light because the light impacted them so they can they got some of that infinite magnet like that 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 chaotic light the big light is somehow impressed in those vessels, in the shards, and the shards are found in this world. It says in that same verse, the world was tohu vavohu, v'ruach elokim, in the spirit of God, it would help if we all had a chumash and you could see it inside, but you'll have to take my word for it, or you can grab one from the shelf if you want. It says v'ruach elokim, and the spirit of God, mirachefet, was hovering al penei on the face of the earth. Merachefet, I may have said this a week or at some point in this in the series. Merachefet is the Arizal says is constitutes a few different words. So the first and last letter, Merachefet. The first letter is mem, the last letter is tough, which forms the word met, which means died. In the in the middle is Merachefet Resh Chet Pei, which is numerically equivalent to two hundred and eighty-eight. So he says 288 shards 
died or fell from the shattering of the vessels. Those 288 shards further subdivide into many other shards and pieces. And that constitutes the sparks of this very uh, magnificent realm, this chaotic realm, but a very, on a light level, very magnificent realm of the world of chaos, and it's embedded in the fabric of the universe. Every person, every human being, continues their result, has certain sparks, shards, from the vessels that they are destined, not, not just destined, but they are, it's, it's their mission, it's our mission to access certain shards and sparks. And to, and, and to engage in them in a way that lifts them up and returns them back to a holy place, to a holy source. So we're all spark seekers. We're all shard repairers. We're all in the fix of business. We're all in the business of finding and rescuing those fallen sparks, those fallen shards that fell everywhere throughout the world. With this, the Arizal explained Rabbi Isaac Luria, Loriana Kabbalah, explained the reason for exile, diaspora, suffering, traveling, wandering. He says, when you find yourself in a place, it's because there are sparks there for you to collect and elevate. There's nothing by accident. God guides the footsteps of the human being and puts us exactly where we need to be. So you find yourself delayed in the airport. So Kabbalah says, you know why? Because there are sparks, shards that fell there somewhere in a person, in a thing, whatever it is, and we need to find we, this. This too is part of our mission. This moment, this experience is meaningful. It's not like I have extra time or I'm not where I'm supposed to be. You're, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. We're always exactly where we're supposed to be. Gamzu Latova, this too is for the good, but that's that's almost like. It could, be, it could sound like, well, I'm convincing myself. But this is, it's intentional. It's like I know going in that wherever I am, there's something of meaning. There's something of importance that I am looking for, that I am accomplishing right here, right now. Because there are sparks, there are shards of the vessels that I am accessing or that I can access in this place. You're saying last night? Yeah. In Bo, yeah. Every step of his way was important and somebody was helping him and he was helping somebody. And exactly. He exactly where he needed to be. Exactly. There were signs helping and pushing and exactly assisting on the journey. And so for us, it means something very, I think, very profound. There are no accidents in life, right? Everything is meaningful. Everything is precise. There's opportunity everywhere we look. And to me, the biggest and, and like the most magnificent piece of it is that sometimes the greatest light is found in the lowest of places. Because remember, these shards, these vessels shattered. And when things break, right? If you ever dropped anything that's glass in your kitchen or anywhere in your house, you know that you can clean up the immediate, immediate area, but at some point you're gonna find a piece that went all the way. How'd it get all the way over there? I just dropped it here. It looked like it was contained. There's like a little piece that's gone all the way, you know, across the kitchen, under the fridge, and like, wow, that's, that's there. Interesting. Shards go everywhere. Shards go everywhere. And oftentimes, the highest, the loftiest shards fall to the lowest of places, which is another Kabbalistic axiom. The higher it is, the lower it falls. Like a wall, this is an example used in Kabbalah, it says the stones at the top of the wall, but when the wall falls, they fall the furthest. So the highest falls the furthest away. And so the highest shards, the highest sparks, oftentimes are the ones that are falling the, the, the farthest, i.e. in the lowest of places, in the darkest of places. So in the people that are the most challenging, in the situations that are the most challenging, that are the darkest, if you will, there's oftentimes the greatest potential, opportunity, and purpose in those places. So far from writing those off as being, you know, a mistake or unnecessary or devoid of meaning, we're encouraged to recognize the, the potential laden in these opportunities and then to capitalize on it. But it also puts us in a different position, this teaching, because what it means is that we're all constantly on a mission. 
if you've ever wanted to be in your own thriller, like your own, like, you know, you're behind enemy lines and whatever, and you're looking for stuff, this is life, according to Kabbalah. According to Loriana Kabbalah, this is literally what life is. Life is a seek, not seek and destroy, but seek and rescue mission. We're all like airlift, air dropped in, the soul is dropped in, into a body, we parachute in, we're in hostile territory, and our job is to go in, find the sparks, and get them out. And that means, well, like, on a very basic, Kabbalah speaks of this extensively, on a very like practical example, at level. When we eat, the food that we eat, there are incredible divine sparks in the food. Remember, the, the rule is, the lower it is, the higher it is. So food, you know, we had bagels this morning, right? Oh, like a Krispy Kreme is really up there. Well, <laughs> oh, okay. let's go into plan. I'm not going to comment on any specific thing, except for bagels, because that's what we have today. But a bagel, right? What's a bagel made out of? It's made out of wheat, I imagine, right? It's made out of wheat, which is growing from the ground. So you have, you know, the earth is providing, the soil, the earth is providing um, the nutrition and the growth, and then you have Egg. vegetation, and then... And, and you have all of these things that are conspiring together to make a bagel and the human input and the point is according to Kabbalah you have we, the, the basic understanding is that there are tremendous sparks of light inside this food and we have a choice how we're going to eat are we going to eat purely for physical gratification which means that we're kind of lowering ourselves down to the level of the food, or are we elevating the food to our level, which is not really about us, but really about something higher than us, i.e. for something for, for higher purpose. And on a basic level, what that means is, are we mindful, it's all about mindfulness, are we mindful when we eat that the energy that we're eating in order to gain energy and the energy that we're gaining from this food is going to be used to study Torah, to study Kabbalah. So this is a great example. We're, we're drinking, we're eating, whatever we're doing this morning. And when we have in mind that this is for, to, to, to keep our mind sharp, to keep us energized and awake, to keep us you know, healthy and satisfied so that we can study Torah, study Kabbalah. So we're elevating now the gastronomical experience. We're elevating, it's not only within us, but we're elevating the food itself and the sparks within the food back to its, to its intended place, back to its source. But let's get back to the world of chaos. So the world of chaos has a lot of light and a little bit of vessel. The vessels are too small to contain the light, so the vessels shatter and they constitute and they and they they're embedded in, in our reality. Now, it may sound like this was a cosmic mistake. Like, wow, you know, God is kind of like mixing chemicals. Oops, too much light, too little vessels. Psh, Let's try again. Let me pour only a little bit of light into this, and then let's see if it works. Remember the volcanoes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Baking soda and vinegar. Yeah, that thing. I was hoping somebody would remember how to make oh, that. Yeah. Right? Wasn't there, like, Mentos and Diet Coke also? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that, like, the quick quick version? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you just drop it in and... Okay. I am not advocating, do not try this at home, all that stuff. All right. My point is... You know, it, on a basic level, on a surface level, it would seem like God made a mistake. Like there was this world of chaos, it didn't work out, and so God tried again, and he created this world of tikkun, and, and, and we're a sustainable world. That wasn't sustainable, and we're sustainable. There are no mistakes. There are no mistakes. Number one, that intense light falls into our reality, and now we can access the light in kind of a roundabout way, as I said, through our mission in life. So that's one thing. Second thing is really in order to create physical reality, because the world of, of Toh, the world of chaos is not physical reality yet. We exist, Tikkun exists, now we have physical reality, the world of repair. The world of chaos is not physical reality yet. You can't get physical reality from spiritual reality in a normative, progressive way. If you start off with spirituality and you kind of lessen it, spiritual, less, 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 less. You don't hit physical. It's a different, are you with me? It's a different, um, a dimension? it's a different reality. Yeah. Like you can take an idea, okay, you can take an abstract idea and concretize it. Like you can take 
like I imagine tonight. You can take quantum physics and then make it, you know, somewhat more tangible, understandable, tangible, give examples, concretize it, whatever. You're not going to create an apple out of it. It's not going to happen yet. No, right? You're not, you're not, it's like the idea still is an idea. No matter how concrete, no matter how tangible, how graspable an idea is, it's still an idea. It's still in the realm of, of thought. It's not becoming a tangible item, right? You with me? <laughs> so no matter how, if you start off with light, when I say light, I don't mean physical light, I mean spiritual light, energy, whatever. It's called light in Kabbalah. Spiritual light. And you lessen it, diminish it, symptom it, whatever you're going to do to it, it's going to still remain light. So how do you ever get physical existence? So the Kabbalists explain that this is one of, one of the, I don't know, benefits, but one of the purposes of the, of, of the shattering of the vessels because when it shatters, what that means is something brand new is happening. Something radical is happening. There's a radical shift in what was. So before there was light in some sort of vessel, I and mean, the vessels weren't physical, like we might imagine, like clay or glass or whatever. It's a sp still spiritual vessels. But once it shatters, what it means is the construct, the, f the spiritual construct is broken, and now there's, there's a groundwork for physical constructs. So know this, that the shattering of the vessels, the world of chaos, was not by accident, and it wasn't a miscalculation. It wasn't a mi uh, um, like the formula gone wrong, like new Coke, joking. It wasn't a formula gone wrong, not joking. Um, it was deliberate in order to get something radical, in order to get something, it's almost like, I'm trying to think, it's like, imagine a team, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this as, I haven't developed this in my head, so if it comes out, if it makes sense, it makes sense, if not, maybe we can work on this together. But imagine a team is meeting, and they're discussing, like designing something, and they've designed that thing for many years and many iterations, and they feel like in this design meeting, it's still the same ideas going around, and it's still maybe a little bit of a modification, but it's still the same old. But they want something brand new. Something has to break, something has to shatter, some previous construct has to be completely obliterated to get something new. You with me on this? Yeah, and that happens maybe through something dramatic. So maybe instead of the team meeting in the way it normally meets, maybe they go, they go out for some, I don't know, right? Maybe they, they do something different than they've always been doing in order to evoke something new. And so the shattering of the vessels of Tohu is that radical shift that precipitates physical reality. So then using physics, oh, sorry. No, go. Okay. Uh, so using physics, right, uh, Newton's three laws um, about inertia, that an object stays stationary unless uh, a force acts upon it. Right. And it's uh, potential energy versus kinetic energy. So something has to occur to change that energy. Right. And so God basically creates this chaos and the shattering of the vessels. And that's a necessary step in moving from spiritual, like light, 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 to physical existence. Like that doesn't, it's not a norm, it's not part of the flow, right? Like you and I can talk about a car and we can describe it in general terms and very specific terms and then really describe it in, in like incredible detail and it, there's still not gonna be a car in front of us. Even if we can imagine in our minds, we're not gonna get a physical car yet. That would be kind of cool, right? It's not gonna happen. So how do you get from one to the other? Something has to change, so there has to be a shift. There has to be a, a um, again, it doesn't, doesn't flow, we're never, the point is that this is, this is the radical shift that happens, the shattering of the vessels. So I, I, I mentioned this, again, to give you a little bit of background into the world of, of, of Toho, the world of chaos, and understand the utility of the world of chaos, how it was necessary, a necessary step in the emergence of our physical reality. But really what I wanna to get to is what drove the chaos? What drove the chaos? And this is, once uh, I just, I'm just gonna um, uh, um, introduce it. I'm not gonna get into it yet, and we're gonna take, uh, I'll, I'll take what you wanna say, but let me just finish the introduction. So I'm going to, in just a moment I will explain what exactly constituted the chaos of the world of chaos? Like, wh what does it mean? There was too much light. What, it was just like amped up? Like just too much light on the, on the light 
lightometer? Like what was going on? What, what actually was going on in that, in that realm that, that made it chaotic? And we'll see how that chaos in the world of chaos can be experienced in this world as well in other forms of chaos. Not in the shards that fell from the vessels, but how that chaos within the light can be mirrored here in this in our realm as well in human chaos. We'll get there in a moment, yeah. You mentioned that she was a mm -hmm. and Yes. Yes. How do you fit the shadows of the vessel in there? Is it just omitted in her sheet between the time of Calvary? It's alluded. It's alluded. All of those verses precede the statement, bless you, please precede the um, the first utterance of creation. Okay, so the no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It precedes the Vayomer Lekemi Yihar Yihar, let there be light. And that light is the light of our world, not the light of, of, of the world of chaos. Okay. So all of those verses are kind of like, according to Kabbalah, are the backdrop, but it's alluded. It's not, it's not, um, it's not uh, stated like overtly, like on the surface. But the Kabbalists say the Kabbalists are teaching the truths of you know that lie behind the creator realms, and they say, here you see it in the verses, you see it alluded to. Tohu vavohu merachefet. This is what's going on behind the scenes. But it's all before we get to creation. Yeah. You could say. Maybe he'll get to that tonight. I have no idea. Maybe. Yeah, so look, where that crosses over, how that crosses over, I think that's an emergent conversation. But I'll tell you, hundreds of centuries ago, the Kabbalists were talking about this format, yeah. this style of creation, how things emerge from a bang, from chaos, from an explosion, and how that forms, you're right, and the language is similar. How exactly it ties in? Again, I'll leave it up to the experts. But the language is certainly, we have similar language. I mean, they're talking about different things on some level, but it's similar language, at least. At the very least, similar language, yeah. So the notion of the, the vessels shattering, that not being a bad thing, that reminds me of the, of the flood story. Because you can read it as it was, God made a mistake and it was bad. So it blew up and he had to destroy it, yeah. Or cleanse it. Yeah, it seems the same thing. Like you can, it, you can view it negatively if you want to. Right, people. I would imagine that if you encounter these, um, the, this capitalist the teaching of the shattering of the vessels, if you encounter it without the right context, it sounds like terrible, chaos, a mistake, catastrophe, creation gone wrong. You know, 1.0. <laughs> you know, it's like the first pancake didn't make it out. You know, without getting burned. <laughs> By the way, for the record, my pancakes, the first one is always fine. It's always <laughs> absolutely fine. It's all about preheating properly. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Well, it seems like, you know, I'll speak just for myself, but, you know, like the, the shifts that come when you were talking about, you know, everything changes. And yes, radical. the opportunity yes. there. It, it, we almost never, or I almost never make the shift myself. It's like it comes upon, you know, it's almost like we just are, you might even have an inkling or something, but usually we just are, are subject to, or it feels like we're subject to these surprises. Yeah. Are you talking about the surprises in our journey when we encounter things, or the surprise in the process of something radically new emerging? Something radically new that's, like, and it's like Lekha, you know, like you're uncomfortable, you're forced to go for, right. you, you, you're, you're pushed. You didn't really want that. Or I think the greatest breakthroughs in life happen when we have shatterings of vessels. Mm -hmm. We don't ask for it. And it hurts. The process can be hurt. And the truth is we could do it ourselves, but we typically don't. Yeah. Because who wants to do that? But any growth happens through shattering of the vessel. Mm -hmm. Every, any growth happens through letting go of what you had mm -hmm. and discovering something new. Otherwise, it's very incremental. It's like evolving... It's like an evolution, like a slow, gradual evolution of what was. Or resisting it. Which is yeah, really yeah, exactly. It's, it is what it is because it was what it was. And, and, and it's, uh, maybe it's going to move a little bit, tweak a little bit here or there. But anything new happened through. Look, again, getting back to, to product design, 
practice. I don't know, for me, that's the easiest way to conceptualize it. If you want something new, you got to throw out what was. Because if you keep what was in front of you, you're just going to make that a little bit different. It's like people get fired. Like the whole team got fired for the new team. Oh, exactly. Or like the rabbi who moved from Bavel, from Babylonia, the Talmud says, sorry about a rabbi who moved from Babylonia to Israel. And there were two Talmudic centers. And the Israeli Talmudic center was on a higher level. So he said he fasted for a long amount of time so that and he prayed to God that he forget everything that he learned in Babylonia, so that when he went to Israel, he could start from a, with, with a clean slate. Because he, he knew that coming in with all of his prior knowledge, it would necessarily, it would, what's the right word? It would um, constrain. constrain, it would create a bias where he wouldn't be open to really learning new information. It would all be like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That fits into my previous construct of, 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 of information. So with thinking patterns you know there are it's not only what we know but it's how we learn it's how we know and we all have a way in which we learn like how we learn and 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 based on how that is it's usually pretty set it's possible to break and i think if we break that radical new opportunities come up Part, one of the ways to study Torah along the lines of the rabbi that fasted is to really come in to, to the experience of studying Torah and clear everything out. So it's not like, oh, yeah, that fits into my worldview, my political view, my emotional view, my, my intellect, where everything else is, is, is cleared out and we're just you know, open, you know, a blank slate to receive that, that information. That's the ideal. And it's hard because anytime we have to deconstruct self, it's hard. And you're right. Oftentimes life does that for us, unfortunately. But then hopefully it becomes something that, 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 lend, that leads to something positive. But yeah, life has a way of, of kind of opening us up, shattering the vessel so that we can have something else. Um, who was it? Leonard Cohen? There's a crack in everything anthem, right? There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So shattering is good sometimes. It never feels good. It never feels good. What type of, what is it, a snake that has to shed its skin and gets another skin? Mm -hmm. Or like certain things, they, they have a shell, they have to, it, 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 they have to take it up. Snail. Whatever. Snail. Snail. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, we have, we have these examples throughout, throughout the creator reality. Okay, fine, so let's talk about what, what was the root of the chaos. So Kabbalah explains very simply. This is something that, that hopefully we're pretty familiar with. The notion of the ten sefirot, yes? Ten divine energies, ten sefirot. Chachma, three intellectual, seven emotional. Chachma, bina, dat. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Chabad. Chesed, gevura, teferet. Netzach, hod, yesod, malchos. Malchot. Um, love, or kindness, restraint, compassion, Ambition, humility, communication, and leadership. So three intellectual, seven emotional qualities, ten spherot. Okay. In the world of chaos, each sephira was independent and full on full blast, in full force. So let's talk about the emotional ones because that's where the chaos really comes in. Chesed is pure love. It's not just love as an emotion, but it's the modality of giving and generosity. And it's about like the energy flow is from inside outward. It's flowing, constantly flowing out. That's chesed. And gevura is the opposite. Gevura is withdrawn and holding inside. So the energy is moving inward. So it's like restraint. So if, if I'm using my hands as an example, chesed is this. And gvura is this. Chesed is giving. Gvura is withholding. These are opposites. You can't have more opposite than this. So oftentimes it happens in families where one parent is this and one parent is this, right? One is more, again, it's not a judgment, but one is more 
trying to use words here that lenient. are not going to be yeah lenient. That's a better. That's a that's a neutral. It's somewhat of a neutral. Lenient and open. It's good. No 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 problem. Absolutely whatever. And the other one is disciplinarian, and that can create some tension. Now we know this, right? If two parties are trying to work together, right? What what needs to happen? And one person is chesed, one person is gevura. What has to happen? There has to be a tempering, if you will, a lessening. Turn down the chesed a little bit, turn down the gevura a little bit, and then we can work together. Because otherwise, full force, full blast chesed and gevura are necessarily going to have conflict. Again, there's one child and two parents. And one parent's like, stay out however late you want, Yes, you can have the car. No problem. It's all good. Absolutely. I'm not saying this is good or not good. But giving, giving, giving. And the other parent's like, no. You need to be on this, that, that, the other. That's not going to... There's no co... There's no working there. Right? Because each one... If, if each one, each personality is full blast, then there's no co... Not commingling. There's no um, cooperation. There's no working together. So how does it work when it works? It works if the chesed says, my nature is giving, but I recognize that sometimes to give is not healthy. Like if a little child asks for a knife, it's not generous to give a child a knife. It's destructive to give a child a knife. Right? Or fire. So therefore, although I am by nature chesed and giving, I'm going to say no. Likewise, the Gevura personality that typically will say rules and no can recognize the, the need to give and to say yes. Now that's where you have Gevura in Chesed and Chesed in Gevura, i.e. where each one is not full blast 100%. I don't want to hear the opposite, but each one is working with the other. If you've ever seen, oh, this is a good example. If you've ever seen a depiction of the ten sefirot, it looks. It usually looks like this on the sheet. You see the background image, where you have like different dot circles, whatever. Okay, it usually looks like this. You know why? There's a right side, there's a left side, and there's a center. And you know what that means? Right, left, center. There's a word that that evokes, and that word is balance. There's right, there's left, there's center, but there's balance. So the right is working with the left, and then there's a middle point where everyone comes together, but it evokes the sense of balance. It's called, in Kabbalah, this, can, this construct of the tense of wrote is called partsuf. You know what partsuf means? Face. You know why it's called the face? Look at a face. It has center and left and right. Right, left, center. Right, center. Okay, this is my right, your left. Whatever, right, left, center. I don't want to get too confusing here. The face is a great example of, right, a very immediate structure of uh, that we can all see and look at, where you have balance, symmetry, right, left center, and so the spherot are normally depicted in this fashion. Why? Because normally, and I say normally because that's the way it is in Tikkun. The spherot are working together and not fighting with each other. Chesed is not like I'm totally chesed and gvura is ridiculous and that. no, chesed is I'm chesed, but I understand the place and the need for gvura. And sometimes I will concede that gvura needs to rule the day. So although I'm more by nature more giving and generous, but today I'll say I need you home at nine. Because I love you. And the Gevura will say, yes, you can, whatever it is, because I respect you. So, respect is Gevura, love is Chesed. So you have the interplay between, between both when they recognize the value in the other and in truth when they recognize the value of something even greater than themselves. Because when it's all about them, then, then this is who I am, and that's it, I'm changing. But if it's about something greater, 
then you realize, yeah, this is my nature, but for the best interest of the bigger picture, I need to like, I need to do something that goes against my nature now for the greater good or for what's going on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the balance. All of this is tikkun. What is tohu? Chaos. Why chaos? Too much light. But why? What exactly was going on? We'll see it here today. The world of chaos, each sephira, was maxed 100%. And it did, it could, they could not get along with the other sphere. Chesed was pure chesed. Gvura was pure, pure gvura. And it, there was no commingling. There was no cooperation. There was no coordination between one energy and the other energy. And you can imagine a world in which everyone has their opinion and a very strong opinion and polar opposite opinions and no one's backing down. I'm um, theoretically can you theoretically can you imagine I'm speaking a little facetiously can you imagine a world or imagine a small space imagine a room in which you have very 10 very strong minded and willed people that have completely different personalities and perspectives and no one's at all listening can you imagine the chaos in that room welcome to the world of Toho that's what Tohu is. Tohu is light that is full blast. Each light, because each sphera is light, each sphera is full blast. Chesed, Gvura, Teferet, Netzach, Hod, Yisod, Malchot, and the three intellectual ones. Each sphera is 100%, 100%, no compromises, no listening, no coordination with any other with any other energy, and the place explodes. The world of Tikkun, our world of repair, is meant to be a world in which the Sfirot do cooperate with each other. I.e., what makes this realm less chaotic than the world of chaos? It's because the light has the potential to be turned down. God turns down the lights, but we also have the ten spherot inside of us, and each of us leans toward one or more of the spherot, and others to, toward uh, to others. We also have the ability to tone down our sphera, our perspective, our feelings in order to cooperate. Or we can adopt the style of tohu, chaos, and be consumed with how we see things. And that's the only way to see things, which breeds chaos. Make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's jump in, because I want you to see this inside. It's so beautiful the way it's, it's expressed. We are in Let's pass these around. We are in. Thank you, thank you. Um, please pass down that way. We have more. I sent down more copies than we need, but just so everyone gets. Um, Partsuf, P A R. Oh, in Hebrew, Pei Reish, Sadik, Vav, Final Fe. Partsuf. Okay, so we are up to. We are in now chapter, I believe chapter three. I'll tell you what page we're on. We are on page five. No, we, we did page five. We are on page six. Last paragraph on page six. Okay, what he said on page five. Let me recap and let's jump in because we need to jump in. We need to see this inside. This will blow your mind. What we did last week in chapter, the beginning of chapter three is we said that getting back... Okay, so put everything on hold for a second about chaos and repair, toho and tikkun, for a moment. Let's get back to human relationships. So we said, we said um, 
the whole premise of this of this text is all about unity and disunity. It's about fighting, people fighting, and people getting along. So he said at the beginning of chapter three a, a basic um, formula, and that is that holiness, kedusha, holiness, is marked by unity, getting along, whereas the opposite of holiness, which is known as klipa, is which means the shell, is marked by disunity. So if something is holy, it's usually getting along. If something is not holy, it's usually in conflict. So that's what he said. So he brought different examples um, uh, from, th from the divine name, Havaya, Yudke Vavke, God's name, which is understood to contain, in a hint, all of the ten he wrote. So here you have all ten energies included in one name in this in this in the state of oneness again because if it's holy then you have unity there's diversity but you have unity within diversity whereas unholiness is chaos everyone's fighting that's unholy. so again holiness is many different units but on the same page getting along that's holiness unholiness is different things in conflict with each other he brought the example of Esau and Yaakov so Yaakov Jacob Jacob is unity. Seventy, uh, the family of Jacob that came down to Egypt was seventy. We started off as a family of seventy when we came down to Egypt, and it says calls him, it call, the Torah calls him Shivim Nefesh, seventy soul, in the singular. Why seventy soul? Although there were seventy, they were all in unity. Whereas Esau, Esau, he had six in his family, and it calls them plural souls. So here you can have seventy that are one or six, that can feel like a thousand. Right? That, that have that plurality. And again, plurality is not the problem. It's are we getting along? That's the question. So diversity is great. We want diversity. God creates diversity. The question is, what do we do about that diversity? So now we know we're different people. Are we getting along or are we fighting? Simple question. Getting along is a mark of holiness. Not getting along is a mark of unholiness. And now let's trace it to the cosmic realms of Tohu and Tikkun. Bottom paragraph, page 6. Did this you say the opposite of Klipa or Hebrew name? Kedusha. Kedusha is holiness, like Kadosh. Kedusha is holiness. Klipa, which means shell, is like that which covers holiness and obscures and conceals holiness. And that refers to the opposite side, also known as Sitra Akhra, the other side. Okay, bottom of page six. This idea can be understood by referring to the concepts of the spiritual worlds of Tohu and Tikkun. See, now you're all expert Kabbalists, so you know when we talk about Tohu and Tikkun, what we're talking about, chaos and repair. Tohu, which is the source of Esav, Esau, represents the realm of separation, right, disunity. Hence, the Kabbalah refers to the Sefirot of Tohu, those ten energies of Tohu, as separate branches. Remember I to told you about the parts of right, left, center? In that's in our world where they're working together, hopefully. In the world of chaos, why is it chaotic? Because no one's working together. They're called anfim mispardim. They're separate branches, and each one is like, no one's on the same page. Imagine if you structure your company and you put different people in charge of the same thing, and no one knows the, the, the other one's in charge. Chaos, right? Everyone's creating something else, and there's chaos, and no one's working, and no one wants to work together because I'm supposed to be in charge. This is what was going on in the world of all intentional, right? No mistakes. This was going on in the world of chaos, the world of Tohu. By the way, how is it depicted, drawn, the sphero drawn in, to in Tohu, chaos? Usually down in a straight line. So you don't have the balance of right, left, center. It's each one is on its own. Chesed, Gevura, Teferd. Not down because there's like a thread, but just without that balance, without that cooperation. Fine. So again, the Kabbalah refers to the spirit of Tohu as separate branches. In Tohu, here we go, let's continue. This is now the end of the fourth line, fifth line of the par last paragraph, um, page six. In Tohu, in the world of chaos, the Midot, the emotive attributes like Chesed, Gvura, love, withholding, etc., they could not, uh, could not tolerate one another. Chesed, kindness, could not tolerate the trait of Gvura severity, nor could Gvura tolerate the trait of Chesed. And what he means by tolerate is because each one is, this is truth, this is reality. Chesed is the way to be. And the other ones, and Gvur is like, Gvur is the way to be. Chesed, chesed is holy, Gvur is holy. They're both right. But each one feels itself as the only game in town by design. Again, 
God created in that realm each sphera without the awareness, the ability to be aware of the value of the opposing mida, the opposing character trait. It only felt itself and knew its own value, and therefore why should it consider the opposite approach? Why should it be open to... Because this is, this is truth. Right? This is my truth. So what? Um, the Kabbalah explains, let's continue inside, the Kabbalah explains that because of this lack of unity, the vessels of the realm of Torah were shattered. Again, now we know all of this stuff, right? So what happens? The, there's so much chaotic, there's a frenzy, frenetic energy in the world of chaos because all of the energies are, are amped up 100%, and they're all just colliding against each other, right? They're not stable. By the way, also, when you have cooperation, it means on some level compromise. And I've been using the example of like turning up or turning down. That's the way, for me, kind of I picture it. But when you turn something down, it can also sit in its vessel because it's not 100%. When you turn it up 100%, it's not getting along. It's chaotic. And the vessels are not just not able to contain it. And the vessels are shattered. Let's continue. From this spiritual intolerance resulted... Oh, look at this. From this spiritual intolerance of the world of chaos, which again was created by God by design for a good purpose, but from this, from this, from this construct resulted the division found in the realm of evil and klipa. In other words, what is the source of disunity? We said before that holiness is unity. And unholiness is marked by disunity. What's the source of that? Because we don't believe, Judaism does not believe in a source that there's God and then there's a source of evil on the same page. Everything comes from God. So what's the highest source to the disunity of, of evil and klipa? It's the world of chaos, which is still a spiritual world. It's a godly world. It's a divine world by design, but it's a chaotic world because each Sphera is amped up 100% and there's no tolerance in that world. Now, they're all holy, but it's holy intolerance, if you will. That becomes the source of evil intolerance. Are you with me? That was by design. God created it for a purpose to, to explode or implode or whatever, to explode to, so that the greatest lights could form a physical uh, plane of existence and that the shards should be embedded so we have a purpose in life and a mission for all that wonderful stuff. But the bottom line is you have a realm where chaos rules the day and disunity is the nature, the fabric of that realm. That becomes the source of conflict, of evil conflict. In other words, destructive conflict. Where does destruct... How can... How is it possible that two people might not get along? Where does it come from? Spiritually, the world of Tohu. Which, at that level, that conflict is not evil conflict. I would say it's not even bad conflict. It's just conflict. It's divine conflict. It's holy conflict, if you will. But it's still the source now of all conflict that will ever unfold, including the conflict and disunity of the realm of evil and Cleveland. Does this make sense? This is these are the, the highest spiritual origins of conflict because otherwise there's just unity, divine unity. Where does conflict come from? The world of Tohu. For this reason, ah, now he references another hint, another clue in the book of Genesis. For this reason, the kings of Edom, the Torah tells us that Esau's descendants, again, two twins, right? So it's Abraham, Isaac, and then Isaac and Rebekah, they have two kids, twins, Esau or Esau and Esau and Yaakov, Esau and Jacob. So, and they go definitely their own separate ways. And Jacob obviously becomes the father of the Jewish people, and Esau, Esau becomes the father of other nations. What are the other nations that? Esau? Edom. Oh. Yeah, it's typically associated with Rome, the Roman kind of like that <coughs> Western-ish type thing. Whatever. Anyway, the kings of Edom. It's not the Arab. Arab is from Ishmael. Right? Oh. That's from a different, from the other, that previous generation, Isaac's brother. So anyway, um, but Ed, uh, the Torah tells us about the kings of Edom, i.e. Esau's descendants that were kings in the land of Canaan before the Jews came in. In the land of Canaan, i.e. the land of Israel, before the Jewish people 
right? Before the ex, before Egypt, and then the exodus from Egypt, and the Jewish people forty years in the desert, and then getting into the land of Israel. Before that, there were kings of Edom of, that rule that reigned, and the Torah tell, tells us of seven kings. And it says, "Vayimloch vayamas." They ruled and they died. They ruled and they, this one ruled and he died, and this one ruled and he died, and ruled and he died. Kabbalah says we're not just talk, we're not just talking about physical kings who reigned and died and their kids took over or their son took over, but it's rather spiritually the energy of Edom of Asav, which is the unholiness, the klipa, the negative energy. This is the, uh, the symbolism of of reigning and dying, of ruling and dying means the collapse of the world of tohu, of the world of chaos, where you had something and then it, it imploded, it collapsed. So that's like reigning and collapsing, reigning and dying, that's symbolic, that, that's contained in this, or symbolized by the story of, of the kings of Edom. Let's read it inside. For this reason, the kings of Edom, who were the physical counterparts of these spiritual forces, successively reigned and died. Oh, so he says a little bit different. So he says basically, the kings of Edom are the physical manifestation of the spiritual force, i.e. from the world of Tohu, the world of chaos, <coughs> and therefore they reigned and died. By the way, you should know that in, the, in, that in Kabbalah it says that Esau, Esau, came from the world of Tohu, like spiritually. He's more associated with chaos. And Jacob, Yaakov, is more associated with Tikkun, which means that Esau has a lot of spiritual potential, but it's, it, it's chaotic energy. Chaotic energy could go either way. It could either be channeled in the right way, etc., right, and, and, and harnessed for good, or it can be explosive and, and, and devastating and dangerous. So it could go either way. So this is what happens. So Asaf, who symbolizes Klippa and evil, the way it plays out in this world, Asaf comes from Tohu. Tohu is chaos, and therefore it's manifest in his descendants reigning and dying, i.e., there was big light and then explosions, explosions of light. Again, that chaotic, frenetic energy. Now let's continue. Because all of this is to explain, remember how we started this entire series, this entire text, is by recalling the story of Midian and the Jewish people. Midian was the nation that the Jewish people were told, sorry, they were the nation that Moses, Moshe, was told be, shortly before his passing that before you pass away, you need to fight, you need to pull together an army and wage war against Midian. That's your last mission on this earth. And we said, well, what's the big deal about Midian? Like, why, like, why did Moshe have to do it? And why is it connected with his life's mission? Like, what's the, what's the deal with Midian? So he's now explaining what Midian is. What is Midian? Midian is strife and fighting. So let's jump in now, page 7, second, right there at the top. The Kalipa of Midian, and it was the evil of Midian. Midian rep, what does Midian represent? Forget about Midianites living 3,300 years ago. What is, what is spiritual Midian today? Midian, the clip of Midian is strife, contention, and separateness. Not diversity, but fighting. Straight up. Animosity, hatred, right? Fighting. Okay? This is the general principle behind what fell in the shattering of Tohu. So Midian represents disunity, fighting, and that's what caused the world of Tohu to fall. What caused the shattering of the vessels of Tohu? It was the fighting amongst the Sfirot. So the fighting amongst, the, fighting, right? The, the conflict amongst the Sfirot causes the shattering of the vessels. And what is that conflict? Symbolized by Midian. Again, let's start, from the, let's start again from that paragraph. The clip of Midian is strife, contention, and separateness. This is the general principle behind what fell in the shattering of Tohu, in which the emotive attributes were discord, discordant. Midian is not included among the seven nations, the Canaanites, Hittites, and so on. For each of these nations represent one specific attribute of Tohu. The Canaanites, Chesed, the Hittites, Kavura, and so on, as discussed in Kehilat Yaakov, which is another Kabbalistic work. Each of these seven nations, these are the indigenous nations to the land of Israel before the Jewish people conquered the land of Israel. So each of these seven nations, there's seven nations, and again, not surprisingly, seven emotive attributes. So it says, that, he's drawing the correlator right now, but it's in, it's in ancient Kabbalistic works, that the seven nations that inhabited Israel represent the seven negative spherot. Every sphera is obviously divine and holy, but there's a negative counterpart. Like, very quickly, so love, 
could be positive, but can also be obsession. Right? Gvura can be discipline, but it can also be being mean. Right? Everything can, can be... Light and shadow. Yeah. Every, every sphere, every emotive, certainly the emotive qualities... You can have them in a healthy way and in a very unhealthy way. So if, if chesed is giving and love, well then, what about stalking someone, God forbid, right? And obsession and calling them, you know, texting them a hundred times an hour, you know, where are you, what are you doing? You, you, can, you can go overboard with that. And so you have, you have a way, there are ways in which it's healthy and ways in which it's straight up not healthy. So each of the seven nations, again, we're taking stories of the Torah and we're stripping it away from the physical characters and bring it into our lives, right? So what are the seven nations of the land of Israel before, we, before the Jewish people moved in? Those seven nations represent seven negative manifestations of the seven spherot, of those seven qualities, right? So again, Canaanites are chesed, gone rogue. Hittites are gvura, gone rogue, and so on, as discussed in Kilat Yaakov. Each is a specific klipa, klipa means the evil shell, of a specific attribute of tohu, and opposes, because it's the shadow, a specific attribute of holiness. That's the seven. The klipa of midja, midja is not one of the seven. <coughs> the klipa of midja, by contrast, is not of a specific nature. It does not represent one, specific, one single attribute of tohu, but rather the entire realm. Midjan is not to, Midjan is not um, obsession. Chesed gone rogue. Midjan is not um, Gvura, which is um, Yeah, like like too much too much discipline. That's not what Midjan is. Midjan is chaos. Midjan is the underlying force that drove all of the Sfirot into this into this frenetic state. <coughs> so again. You have the seven nations, which represent seven specific negative qualities. But then you have Midjan, which represents the totality of the chaos. Um, the Kriba Midjan, by contrast, is not a specific nature. It does not represent one single attribute of Toho, but rather the entire realm. And hence, it's, character, it's characteristically separate branches. In other words, Midjan is separateness. It's not Chesed gone rogue, Gvura gone rogue. It's disunity. This division is the primary reason for the shattering of the vessels of Tohu, as we said before, which through a chain of progressive descent, the Shashulot, gives rise to seven evil emotive attributes. So how does evil emerge? How does Canaan become evil chesed? It's because of the shattering of the vessels that also takes these pure divine powers and now gives the power for them to be used in a negative way as well. So you could have chesed in a holy state and chesed in an unholy state that derives from or through the process of the shattering of the vessels. But again, what causes the shattering of the vessels is the chaos, is the interfighting. And what causes the interfighting or what represents that? Mission. Thus, and this is the, the big idea, and I want to make this very practical before we close out today. Thus, the clip of Midjan in this world is not included among the seven nations, for it is not an individual quality, but rather the general condition of Tohu, which is divisive. Again, Midjan is divisiveness. What was the downfall of Tohu? Divisiveness. It's not Chesed gone rogue, Gevura gone rogue, it's divisiveness in a negative way. It's fighting. And that is symbolized, that is represented by Midjan. Midjan is that fighting. Um, it is not an effect of the shattering, but rather its root and source of the shattering. It's not a product of, see, when, when the vessels shatter, not only did holy sparks fall into this world, but also chesed has the ability to become, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To be uh, not polluted, but to be uh, not compromised, corrupted. Chesed can be corrupted. Because of the extremes, because it's shattered, now you can have corrupt chesed, corrupt gvura, corrupt uh, tiferet. You can have every now that now the shur can be corrupt, and that gives rise to the seven evil nations, the Canaanites, the Hittites, whatever. That represents the rogue corruption of the sefirot that resulted from the shattering of the vessels. But what caused the shattering in the first place? That was the disunity. That was the fighting. And what's that symbolized by? Midjan. Turns out that Midjan, although it's not one of the seven nations, it's worse than them all. So the, so because it's not a specific quality, it's the chaos. I ended last week's class, I'm sorry for, I ended last week's class with this and I want to say it one more time. 
if you were looking to bring the downfall of this country, right? If you were looking to bring the downfall of this country, you could think of different ways to do it. You could try to attack buildings, God forbid. You could try to attack power grids and utilities, God forbid. You could attack ports, God forbid. You could, you could look to attack subway system. You could look to attack different things. <coughs> and each one would be devastating in its own way. Or you could try one other approach, which is simply to sow disunity. And it doesn't matter in which way. It doesn't matter which way of the disunity. The main problem would be, the main, the main thing would be just sowing disunity mm-hmm. and getting people to turn against each other. That's exactly what is happening. So if you're, I don't want to talk about Russia, but if you, if you are thinking, I don't care who wins, as long as they're all at each other's throats, because that will bring down a nation faster than any specific... I said, I said last week, 9-11 brought people together and that worked against whatever, any, whatever they were trying to do. It wasn't just about bringing down buildings. And it didn't work. I mean, it worked with the buildings. But it didn't work because it brought people together in an unprecedented... Well, I can't say unprecedented, but in a unity that, that, that at least in my lifetime, I've never felt that... And I, I lived in New York at the time... I, I never felt such unity amongst people, amongst New Yorkers, amongst whatever, as I felt in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. That didn't work. It didn't work. You don't bring down... It's like anti-Semitism. It doesn't work because it brings us together. What works? It's Midian. That's, that's what works. So the Canaanites, Chesed gone rogue, it's not going to bring down anything. It still needs to be combated, but it's not, it's not an existential issue. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, right? The Amorites from Emory. None, none, of, none of each one is, represents the opposite of holiness in a specific area, but it's not an existential what is existential? Disunity. Is that what brought down the temple? Yes. The yes. Time? The temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed because of disunity. And historically, historically, we have had the worst, the worst calamities have befallen us as a people and any nation historically when the actual nation itself was fragile. And what creates fragility? It's when the people are not standing side by side, but rather are fighting each other. The greatest, I'm, this is not, it's not, to me it's not even a debate. The greatest nachas, that somebody who dislikes us would get, the greatest nachas is sowing discord and chaos. And it doesn't matter, I'll buy this ad, I'll buy that ad. I don't care, as long as people are fighting, I win if I'm looking to bring down something else. That constitutes victory. Understand this. The klipa of Midian is the, is, the, is the most severe klipa. It's the worst. Klipa means evil. It's the worst evil. It's not a specific manifestation of evil. It's the worst evil because it represents a breakdown of the totality of society. It's that infighting it's what brought down the world of Tohu. What brought down the world of Tohu is not Chesed gone rogue, Vur gone rogue. That happened afterwards. Afterwards it goes rogue. But what brought down Tohu? It's each one, each sphera couldn't tolerate the other one. Was not open to the existence of the other one. Now, we're going to see next week how all of this stems from one word. And we know the word. It all comes from ego. In other words, what's the core of... Again, diversity is good, but what's the core of the fighting, of the intolerance? It's because my way is right, and the only way, and your way is necessarily wrong. So it's the ego that feeds the fighting. And all it takes to sow discord 
is someone to pump up your ego and say, you know, you're right. You're right. And the other one, pff, they don't get it. You are totally right. You know what that does? Just fuels the animosity toward the other. I don't want this to become about, I know I, I, I don't want to, to turn the, this conversation in a certain direction because we have a, enough of that. To me, this conversation, I want to, I really do want to get back to, to the context in which this was published and, 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 and given over, which is about the community. Are we on the same page? Right? Somebody new walks into the walks into Shul, right? Are we open and loving or are we judging? Mm -hmm. Right? On a very human, basic, everyday level. I don't know if we're gonna solve all the world's problems or all the nation's problems. The question is really about you and I. How do we look at someone else? Do we do we care enough about someone else to give them the time of day, or is it like whatever? Like Assume I don't, I don't good will. Yeah. So again, we're setting up, we're setting up the, 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 the conversation here. What we've done is we started off this discourse by talking about this final battle, which sounds like the holy grail of battle, like the, like the, the final war of, of Moses against Midian. And we said, well, what was, what's Midian anyway? Mm -hmm. Seems like you know Joshua could have done it. Why Moses? Mm -hmm. And now he's explaining, we're only three chapters in, but already we have this notion that Midian is not just Midian. Midian is the worst enemy that still plagues us to this day. It's worse than any specific problem. It's a general problem that fosters all the specific problems. The general problem is I, I'm not getting along with the other person. I don't value the other person because I value myself and my ego and whatever it is and I can't value the other person. And that is the battle of a lifetime. The greatest battle and one that's still going on today is the battle against Midian. We're tracing it to its spiritual origins, the world of, of Tohu, the world of chaos. All that stuff is wonderful, but the bottom line is, what do we do about it in our lives? And again, this is what, this discourse was written specifically for this purpose. This is literally the purpose of this text, is to learn how to get along with each other and stop fighting with each other, because it's so critical. It's Moses' final battle, and it's still going on today. What it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So Hashem instructs Moses to do this battle. Mm -hmm. And it's symbolic of our inner disunity. Yes. That we have to overcome. It's not even overcome. We have to constantly be aware that there's a Midian enemy. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to fall into the Midian trap. And there's a force that pushes us into, into conflict. And we have to fight every day of our lives to choose unity over disunity I don't want to speak like too cliche but love over hate literally that choice and that's the Moses our inner Moses which is like we all have Moses inside of us right Moses is like the greatest so the best part of ourselves is called forth for this battle we have to muster whatever strength we have to to be to, to, to be to be aligned with each other and not in conflict because the one because the conflict it's the most devastating because you have nothing if we don't have... We have nothing if, we, if we're not... A, mm -hmm. What is there? It happens inside first. It happens inside first, yeah. It happens within... yeah. Is that a symbolic of why when Moses let down his arm that there was... He was losing him when he raised it up to God? That was about like people looking at God. But yeah, you could say also... Uh, we, might, we might be able to, like, to make a connection there. Yeah. So I was like saying... Um, Yes, yes, that's very powerful. In other words, if you're not actively working on this, then you're probably the other way. Okay, but is the heart not? Yes. You could trace that from Isa, Edom, the Roman, Western civilization to the Holocaust. But how were we Jews responsible for that in terms of not getting along? I'm not no. So when it comes to the Holocaust, I am. I would never say that we did something or that it came because of that. I can only tell you what the Talmud says about the. 
Yeah, yeah. So I. So no, it's a good. It's a good question, and, and I'm happy for the opportunity to clarify because it needs to be clarified. I am not on any level to have the chutzpah to say that I know why something happened. I can only tell you what the Talmud says 1,500 years ago about the temple's destruction 2,000 years ago, that that happened because of of sinat chinam, of fighting, baseless, baseless hatred. hatred. And that other tragedies happened because of that. I can't tell you that in modern times, X, Y, and Z happened because of that. I am not at all qualified <laughs> to start justifying God, which is not our role, and, and to play like expert of why why tragedy happens, God forbid, or whatever. I can only tell you that that's what it's, it's been said historically by great rabbis and sages who took it upon their shoulders to talk about these things and then encourage us in healthy behavior, that they said that, that many tragedies in Jewish history happened precisely because of that fighting. And again, I can only say today, just anecdotally from my own experience, I've seen what happens when something specific is attacked, which brings people together, and it's actually, and that doesn't shake the foundations of a nation, versus when there's, versus when people are turned against each other, which to me, I'm not, I'm not assigning anything to anything, which to me just puts everything on shakier ground, and and, and creates instability. There's instability when there's, when there's conflict. And, and he's saying that conflict is a greater form of klipa, a greater evil than any specific thing. Any specific trait, you'll deal with it. But insta instability in the sense of, of, of infighting, that's the most devastating. All right, so that's, that's it for today. We have a lot more to talk about. And next week, like I said, next week we're going to talk about ego, the role of ego in all of this. Um, baseless hatred, sinat chinam, is going to come up extensively in chapter 4. And there's a lot to discuss. This is 32 chapters, the whole text. Um, so, yeah, we're getting there. We're, we're well on our way. Thank you very much for joining me today for Kabbalah and Coffee.